Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Vicki Goodman, and I am excited to welcome you to today's Open Mind program with Dr. Uma Naidu, Harvard-trained psychiatrist, nutrition specialist, professionally trained chef, and author of the groundbreaking book, This Is Your Brain on Food, an indispensable guide to the surprising foods that fight depression, PTSD, ADHD, anxiety, OCD, and more. Dr. Naidu, or Dr. Uma as she is often called, will be joined in conversation by Dr. Xiaoping Li, Professor of Medicine and Chief of the Division of Clinical Nutrition at UCLA. Dr. Lee also holds the Linda and Stuart Resnick Endowed Chair in Human Nutrition at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. A huge thank you to both of our preeminent scholars, Dr. Uma and Dr. Lee, for taking the time from their busy schedules to educate us about the science of nutrition and the important link between nutrition and brain health. Just briefly, for those of you who are with us for the first time, today's program is part of our Open Mind Community Lecture and Film Series, sponsored by the Friends of the Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior at UCLA and the Resnick Neuropsychiatric Hospital Board of Advisors. The Open Mind brings together thought leaders in science and culture for relevant and meaningful conversations about mental health issues that affect us all. Following the discussion, we have reserved time for your questions, which we ask you to please type into the Q&A located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Time permitting, we will try to get to as many questions as possible. Today's program will run for one hour and is being taped and will be available for viewing tomorrow on our YouTube channel that can be found on our website friendsofthesemmelinstitute.org. There you will also find a library of videos from past Open Mind programs, a calendar of exciting upcoming events, and information about our Friends Scholar program that supports the research of early career neuroscientists at UCLA. And now let's get started. Please join me in giving a warm Zoom welcome to Dr. Uma Naidu and Dr. Xiaoping Li. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Vicky, for that warm welcome. Uh, and thank you for asking me ahead of time to share a little bit about my journey in writing my book called, This Is Your Brain on Food. It really does begin my childhood as many things do. As a psychiatrist, I'm all too familiar with some of that. But um, I always had a love for food and uh, good healthy eating, which I learned from my maternal grandmother. Uh, my mom was in medical school during the daytime, so I somehow skipped out of preschool, uh, not quite sure how I was able to do that, and spend time with my maternal grandmother, to whom my book is dedicated, and learned really, you know, naturally uh, healthy eating habits, such as, you know, picking fresh vegetables from the garden and watching her prepare them. But along with this came my um, understanding of yoga and meditation, because my grandparents taught me that. But at the same time, I came from a family of many uh, allopathic physicians and a few Ayurvedic practitioners. And in keeping with all of that, there was always interesting discussions at the table. And, you know, so far as to say that I brought much of this with me into my academic training. And I felt that when I was learning psychopharmacology, and the impact of very important medications, which have been life-saving for many of my patients, that there needed to be more tools in the toolkit because I felt that I, there was space for mind-body connection understanding, a connection of there being more tools that individuals should use for mental well-being. And food was really an, an easy opening conversation because mental health is still up until now, even in the United States, highly stigmatized. Um, very early on in my career, I had a very important moment with a patient that really changed how I began to think about it because I think Dr. Lee can attest to the fact that medical doctors don't learn enough about nutrition. And uh, a patient came in um, very upset with me in the Boston area, our favorite coffee is Dr. 
can go and ounce coffee. And he had a very large cup in his hand, a 20 ounce size, and he was accusing me of causing him to gain weight. Now, I had his medical record in front of me on the computer, and I knew it wasn't me. But the important moment when I started to translate to him, because I chose to distract him, and I asked him, well, tell me, well, what did you put in your coffee today? And when he told me, it ended up being more than a quarter cup of processed crema, um, as well as about eight teaspoons of sugar. And my aha moment was really when his eyes lit up as though a light bulb had gone off, understanding that this was a simple thing, um, understanding calories, just understanding um, what empty calories were specifically, that he could make a change that was very powerful. We went on to have a very a long and therapeutic relationship where he did much, much better and was also able to lose weight. But I understood the power of translating that information and really decided to pursue that. Um, I would just, just finish by saying um, that the evolution of my book also came from my trip to Conway School, which is an ode to Julia Child. Uh, for those of you who've heard me before, I didn't know how to cook because I came from that large South Asian family and everyone else cooked. Um, so when I, I uh, was studying, I really had to bring my mom's spices, my grandmother's recipes and start to explore that. But cooking became a very creative space for me and a canvas upon which I could create. So uh, whereas my colleagues were also studying, you know, would be wondering what to get for takeout. I was always excited about what to prepare. And I would, you know, uh, often watch Julia Child on public television in Boston, and that gave me the confidence. So my trip to culinary school was really to learn more and an ode to her, um, her stunning work, her, um, the brilliant way in which she taught cooking and spoke about it. And I was very fortunate that these things that I loved to do and pursued um, were able to come together in the clinic that I started at Mass General. And this is where I started to really collect more and more data and uh, start to be able to implement the nutritional psychiatry principles to help people feel better. And that's really how my book arose in a long-winded way. I was blogging for Harvard Health Publications and a report reached out to me in a, an article in which I was featured went viral and long story short, that was how uh, publishers and agents got in touch with me. And I think that for me, um, Destigmatization of mental health, finding a way for individuals to truly feel better is very close to my heart. And I feel that again, um, food, nutrition, and that discussion is an easy way to uh, really open up uh, the window into how someone is feeling and have them really feel that you can have a conversation about that in addition to any form of treatment they may they might need. And that was really how the book came about. Um, thank you for asking that question. Okay, Dr. Naidu, that is uh, very impressive. That definitely it is not the uh, conventional journey um, to be a psychiatrist <laughs> writing, a, you know, antidepressant or, um, you know, medications. Um, my personal experience, there's some similarity like yours. Um, after medical school, I uh, pursued a PhD, trying to really, um, you know, learn more about science to benefit the patient. Um, I actually did my research in cardiology and early of my career. With more life experience, I realized cardiovascular disease, actually, it is a truly a preventable disease. Um, it is a result of how we live our life. The other aspect is that when you get to the time you need to see a cardiologist, it is quite late of the game. Um, that is my motivation, um, gaining training in nutrition. Now I actually doing research and seeing patient as a specialist um, in clinical nutrition. And what we have learned in the last 20 years is that when we talk about nutrition, it is not just giving people enough calories. It is not about, okay, I'm taking my daily vitamins. And it's actually even not just for our human cells anymore. This is very much linked to what you're gonna talk about, how the gut and brain are connected. 
and we are not in the time anymore we can conveniently point our fingers at our parents and say hey i have high blood pressure i'm gaining weight or i have depression is all your fault and now we know the genetics, you know, mostly the DNA we inherited from our parents, one, you know, half from my, our fathers and a half from our mothers. That truly is only about 30% who you are at this moment. The other 70% actually is truly a dynamic process, how you live a life how are you taking care of your body and how your genetics are changing and adjusting to the environment. And one of the major progress in the last 10 years in particular um, is the uh, fact we're able to see those gut bacteria or actually microbes, not just bacteria alone, with modern technology. And we used to think whatever we eat, you know, it will be matter if we can get them into our blood, meaning bioavailable, and rest of it is just passing through. And that is so not true anymore. Now, every time we eat, the, the nutrient we absorb into our blood in the, from small bowel most of the time, and that's for human cells directly. But rest of it actually serve a very important purpose, and that is, and is uh, feeding the gut bacteria in our large intestine that have been there since we come to this world. And those bacteria are truly our essential neighbors in a sense. And they then, you know, fed on uh, what we passing along. And that will shape the community of our microbes. And then they also release further, um, you know, we call metabolites, That's, that can be nutrients or can be other small molecules and then get into our blood again, impact on our whole body. Also, the entire gastrointestinal system have all special cells lined up by really interact what is in the gut, what is the bacteria there, and they respond. I'll give you an example, like a serotonin. It is one of the major neurotransmitters uh, impact on our mood. And that is essentially made by the special cells aligning the gastrointestinal tract. So you can imagine how you know, the gut feeling and what we eat can really impact on who we are. So those are things, you know, we, you know, we wasn't taught when we were in medical school and both of us, but this is a new technology. Your book is really bringing everyone's knowledge um, up to date and really um, no longer just thinking the way in the traditional, you know, uh, some, some degree stereotype uh, thinking. And this is really the new era to look at everything in a very, very different way. And I think your book um, would really um, you know, play the critical role uh, in this, um, you know, critical time um, in a sense. I really um, you know, appreciate this opportunity so we can really talking about and what we learned and to benefit all our community. Absolutely, and thanks for sharing that, Dr. Lee. You know, I was thinking about your research in cardiovascular disease and uh, was recently um, just writing again about beetroot juice um, because it turns out that, you know, um, beetroot juice has a very powerful antioxidant, as you know, uh, betalain. And it's actually in research has been shown to improve blood pressure. Um, so it's interesting that all of these, as we understand more about what an antioxidant is, what an anti-inflammatory food is, and we understand the power of the 39 odd trillion microbes of which the there are approximately five different types that live in our, our um, gut. We therefore understand how powerful they are in terms of producing 90% uh, of the serotonin, 
Um, and and 90% also of the serotonin receptors on the gut, which is a reason that many of my patients now understand that if they are prescribed a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor like Prozac, Zoloft, Prozac, and others, that they may sometimes initially experience some gastrointestinal discomfort when they start a new medication like that. So it's it, to me, the um, I share your fascination and, and, and wanting this yearning knowledge to understand and more about the gut microbiome and really its relationship with, uh, with how the neuro, neurotransmitters. And that's a lot of the work that I did for my book was un uncovering what were these interactions. And I don't need to say to you, Dr. Lee, being the expert that you are, the, that you know, nutritional science and, and nutritional epidemiology research changes all the time. But with that being said, what we've been able to at least understand is that the missing conversation in the room, you know, we talked to our doctors about weight gain from COVID. We talked to our doctors about um, family history of type 2 diabetes. But more and more, we are understanding that things like inflammation are at the basis of several conditions, including things like depression, anxiety, and cognitive issues. So that's, you know, inflammation has many different roles. But when we speak about inflammation in this context and low grade inflammation that gets set up in the gut, we then understand that this very important gut brain connection um, is so vitally important to our overall health. You know, the gut and brain originate from the exact same cells in the embryo and then divide apart and form the two organs, the brain and the gut. Then they remain connected by the vagus nerve, which is the 10th cranial nerve which then speaking to your point about neurotransmitters and them being, those being so important, one of them being serotonin, which we often call the happiness hormone, um, are involved in chemical messaging in a bi-directional way between these two organs all of the time. And you know, for, for the times we're in, we also shouldn't forget that 90, um, that, that, sorry, that more than about 70% of our immune system is also in the gut. So it's interesting, actually, I don't know what you would think about this comment, but I was speaking to colleagues recently, and some of them were actually envisioning the gut microbiome or this axis or this, this ecosystem as almost a new organ because so much goes yes. on when, in, the gut micro, in, yes. in the gut microbiota. <laughs> Right. right. It's almost so, like Grand Central Station. Right? Yeah, we call it invisible organs. Um, yes. Each individual of them we cannot see with our naked eyes, but we yes. actually put them all together. They weigh about, you know, four to five pounds. What I really meant to have all the microbes on the <laughs> surface of ourselves, in our bronchus, and, you know, all the gastrointestinal tract, all together, mm -hmm. there are four to five pounds. It is really mm -hmm. tremendous. And they all number us 10 to 1 yes. ratio. So you know, we basically <laughs> really in the ocean of microbes. So that's very important. When we talk about nutrition, we're not only you know, taking care of human cells, we got to take care of them as well. I particularly want to make a comment. So you actually uh, spend the time to learn culinary. Um, you know, uh, you get trained in how to cooking food. That is another major um, aspect. I think we need to pay more attention to it. Um, human beings evolved millions of years on Earth, um, mostly uh, from eating real food. Um, yes. You know, single food. You know, that can be vegetables or a fruit. And they are very different than, you know, we have a piece of bread or white rice. They're um, so diverse with many different um, active compounds. They only come from plants. This is beyond, you know, carbohydrate, fat, and protein, and the vi vitamins, minerals. And those things, and we cannot see, like you said, the um, We call the phytonutrients. We start realize, and those are so um, important to our health. Now, also we know if we take beta carotene out of carrots, just take a beta carotene pills, that is not the same at all um, from eating carrots um, mm -hmm. of his, itself, because the whole um, you know plant um, you know with 200 at least compounds altogether 
it is very different than we taking a single molecule. Um, that, that is really true, uh, compare food versus you know, any single compound that we then call in medication. And particularly now we um, using so much processed food or we call process aid, and even mm. they're safe by you know, our mm -hmm. government standard um, mm -hmm. in the sense of not causing cancer or anything right away, but they are not necessarily not changing our metabolisms. And right. that is another thing I think um, we really should and learn all over mm -hmm. again how to mm -hmm. cook the food and prepare the food and therefore give our body um, the best nutrient and possible. And particularly when you talk about inflammation, um, obesity and all of that. And even in the pandemic we're in right now, we're talking about vaccines. I wish you know, uh, the president would talk about obesity because obesity really is set the platform how healthy our body uh, are and also how our immune system is functioning. Mm -hmm. The real ultimate, um, you know, really um, uh, the force keep us ourselves healthy, not just from COVID-19, different variant, but for everything is our immune system, our own mm -hmm. health. So I think that this is so timely, we're talking about nutrition to, uh, feed our human body, heat our gut microbiome, take care of our mood, um, so we can mm -hmm. have a better life. And we really, uh, you know, hopefully would not have disasters like we are now with the COVID-19. And I think, you know, to your point, Dr. Lee, COVID-19 also really shone the light on the, poor, the, the, the level of poor nutrition that we're unfortunately yes. consuming through the standard American diet, you know, given that acumen, not everyone is eating that way. I fully respect that. This is a generalization, but for many people who um, succumbed to COVID or ended up with long-term side effects of COVID, they had pre-existing conditions. Um, and, you know, what COVID also did is shone the light on that silent pandemic, which has always been mental health that stigmatized and not brought forward in that way individuals who survived uh, COVID infections had many of them did, did end up or, or have long haul syndrome and a very big component of that is brain fog um, and exhaustion, fatigue, um, inability to concentrate. So, you know, it, 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 the level of mental, mental uh, new mental conditions that have arisen in individuals with the syndrome are also significant. So I completely agree with you. If we were actually addressing obesity, if we were actually addressing how we should be eating, and we're not saying you need to make a souffle, you know, we just, we're just talking about how do you make healthy whole foods again? How do you go back to times when life was simpler? You know, it, it, food didn't come out of a package of frozen dinner or processed food. Um, and I understand it's very difficult in our environment to avoid those. But I think the greater awareness that we can have as a country about this, and COVID has really taught us that, that if we need to take some steps back from this um, in order to grow healthier, taking care of our immune systems, if our bodies, if our gut uh, microbiome is inflamed due to how we're eating, you know, um, French fries, and this is my, one of my favorites, um, you know, French fries from fast food restaurants have sugar in them because the research and development has been done to make them hyperpalatable. This is the reason when you're in a fast food drive-through, you always wanna buy the larger size. When you buy the larger size, you can't put it down. And a study in nutrients this year showed that these hyperpalatable foods are actually addictive. So if we, you know, if we don't start to think more carefully about what we're doing, and that's where mindfulness comes in and looking at our overarching health, not just a silo of um, one type of disease or one condition, but looking at it in, in an integrated way is one way that we can find our way, uh, find our path forward. Um, so I feel, uh, you know, addressing those conditions becomes more, become more important and 
finding ways to prepare, you know, I, I like to, um, I talk about pillars of nutritional psychiatry and one of them is eat whole, be whole. And the example I give to people is eat the orange, skip the store-bought orange juice. Store-bought orange juice has the fiber stripped of it. One in 10 Americans gets enough fiber. Uh, we know this from research. So, so, you know, eating that orange gives you the fiber, the vitamins, the nutrients, everything that you need um, to, to, to really be, be having a sustainable way of eating versus the, what I find out I'm not sure if you see this a lot of patients, but the fad, the fads that go on or the diet wars that go on and they come in very confused. What should I eat today? What should I give up? What should I exclude? Instead of just thinking about healthy whole foods, you know, and, and like you said, those simple times when we ate differently. Yes, I totally agree. I think the pandemic is truly a waking up call for us to examine our um, own nutrition and the nutrition for the society. And that it is, I think, more important um, to, ad you know, to address so we can all live a better life. And with you have just said, we see plenty of patients with post-COVID, um, you know, conditions mentally and physically. We have never uh, seen so many patients in our clinic. Um, so right now, we actually end up, uh, you know, have a wait list, uh, you know, to see everyone. That truly reflect what you have said. Um, talking about food, uh, I also wanted to echo what you have just said. Um, human being requires so many different things. We're on the top of the food chain. Um, so often people feel, okay, I need to get my own juice uh, in the morning, but every day may not be the best choice. And orange juice has beta carotene, so vitamin C's, but that's not a, what your body only need. Maybe you, some days you're gonna have blueberries and you're gonna have blackberries and you're gonna have strawberries. Actually the different uh, fruit or vegetables they have the nutrient is not, they just, you know, design everything for the whole purpose of being eaten by human being to benefit human being. They actually, you know, really try to um, get every nutrient possible for their own survival. Human on the top of food chain truly just take advantage of that. So I really, really talk with our patient to have as diverse a diet as possible. For example, mm -hmm. you know, the um, blue color um, or blue purple, you know, we love um, blueberry and we also give ourselves excuse drink red wine. It's all because of one compound it's called resveratrol. It gives that kind of color. And also, you know, the red color is lycopene, that is the tomatoes and watermelons, mm -hmm. and that red color come, come along. So this is a very um, good, um, you know, cue to us. We not That's only true. need to eat one special food all life, you know, and we really should, should vary up as much as possible so our body would have a chance to get all the nutrients uh, we need. I truly wish very soon down the line, we were able to, okay, I'll check the microbiome or check my blood. <laughs> I know exactly what I need, right? Do I need the onions or I need, um, you, <laughs> know, uh, it, 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 you know, beets. What you did. Absolutely. Right. But, but, but we're not quite there yet. Mm -hmm. And with that have said, you know, diverse is, you know, very important. And also, you know, prepare the food yourself. And there are three main elements that we call pillars. And you know, mm -hmm. you, you do culinary, um, uh, you know, study. Those are fat, salt, and sugar. And when mm -hmm. the three of them all combine together, you are not necessarily able to taste the sweetness mm -hmm. or the saltiness, mm -hmm. and, but they are mm -hmm. there. And instead mm -hmm. of using that and try to use spices, and we actually mm -hmm. do a lot of research with the spice. And mm -hmm. spice, you know, a couple of centuries ago was more precious, more expensive than gold. Yes. Yeah, yes. the Silver Road actually did not start with a, a silk. It actually started yes. with uh, the, uh, the uh, spice from east to the west. Why? Because people learned those mm -hmm. are things to make us feel good, actually including, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, mentally. Um, that's why 
yeah, we start using it. We don't know, you know, what what, what is the science behind, but we sure mm-hmm. know um, they are helpful. And use Absolutely. those instead of, you know, salt and, you know, fat and <laughs> sugar. Um, revisit all the recipes we have learned from grandma or great grandma or grandpa. Yeah. Um, it awesome. is really how, where we uh, should start. And the other thing is cooking does not have to be that difficult. And we actually yeah. now uh, having a weekly lecture every Tuesday afternoon and really just for um, community, for the patient, we have a dialogue mm-hmm. on what food to eat and um, mm-hmm. how can quickly um, fix um, you know, food for you and for mm-hmm. your microbiome. So um, yeah, so if anyone interested, look at our website and then join us. Um, I think those efforts should be really um, expanded. Um, the I other agree. thing is, I do hope colleagues um, like um, ours and the primary care cardiologists or endocrinologists and really start to pay attention and learn um, nutrition. Mm-hmm. I think that will be benef- beneficial and to much broader um, you know, spectrum of our you know, patients and the community. Yeah, and offering more options to individuals because we can speak that language, um, you know. And so I wanted to pick up on a few things that you said because I think they're so vitally important. You know, vitamin C is is important for brain function and it is responsible for the regulation of neurotransmitter synthesis. So it's one of the things that, you know, we speak about that orange um, or some fresh squeezed orange juice. I agree, it doesn't have to be every day, but include it in your diet. But here's the other thing. It's not just citrus fruit that has vitamin C. Red bell peppers have very high levels of vitamin C, as do kiwi fruit. So, you know, when you know things that you should be eating for your better brain health and your physical health, uh, my focus is, of course, the brain. But I do find, Dr. Lee, that many of my patients who are improving their mental health through nutritional psychiatry, their cardiologists, Cardiologists are happier with them, their diabetologists are happier with them um, because they are assuming a healthier diet that is not only great for their brain, it is also helping other parts of their body. And, you know, take, take the B vitamins, for example, thiamine and pyridoxine are actually key to uh, preventing and easing depression. And they help the brain produce and synthesize neurotransmitters involved in mood regulation. So when I talk to my patients about eating certain foods that are rich in these uh, is in these nutrients, you know, it's it becomes important for us to understand that it's we're not just saying oh eat a salad, eat healthy. There are, there is actual scientific evidence now behind this type of thing. And where can you get these vitamins? You can get them from legumes, citrus fruit, bananas, avocados, leafy greens, cruciferous vegetables. You know, and the other the other point I wanted to make, um, Dr. Lee, was you know we you we're touching on epigenetics and 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 that type of thing, and, and studies have also shown in mental health that um, you know blueberries are involved in the downregulation of genes. So yes. I'm very excited about the frontiers that are to come. Um, you know, I don't overstate the evidence of where nutritional psychiatry is at, but there is enough where food is something at the end of our fork, as I like to say something we're doing every day, often several times a day, my attitude towards it is why not? With, of course, the discussion you should be having with your doctor because they're healthy uh, foods like grapefruit and mental health we have to be concerned about because uh, there are interactions with liver enzymes and therefore impacting medications. So that being said, you know, food is an easy go-to that we can use to feel emotionally better, uh, especially now that we know the evidence that's emerging behind it. Right, I see uh, Vicky has come on, but I just wanna (laughs) add one point and provide your body nutrition is one thing and really uh, have nutrition become part of you or used by your organ. The other main element is physical activity. That's the driver for your body to feel the need and therefore they're more efficiently and keep the nutrients as part of you. Thank you both. And I, this is a enlightening and, and very educational 
program. And we are so grateful to both of you for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. And I'm sorry to interrupt, but we have so many questions and I wanna be sure that we have time to get to as many as possible. Um, a lot about mood and food. Um, a first question from Joan Clare about a keto diet. And is it effective in regulating moods? And I'm wondering if you, either of you could speak to that. I can start and by saying first thing first, that is we are all different. And we are not only just looking different, um, but our body actually functioning and metabolize um, food very differently as well. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. Keto diet may work um, for some people, improve their mood, and um, particularly those folks that have trouble with high sugar surge, uh, having mood issues, you know, keto diet by limiting carbohydrate sugar may help them, but it may not be for some other people. So, and that is a truly the art, who you are and what your body need at the given time. So I would not able to say cross the board and keto is good for everyone, for everyone's mood. It really depends on what is your body condition and what is really the problem uh, with your mood, up or down. Dr. Uma? Um, I yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, Dr. Lee. More and more in my practice, um, the nutritional psychiatry treatment plans are highly individualized because I think of the gut microbiome like a thumbprint. I, uh, I evaluated uh, a, a mom and her daughter, uh, actually I was evaluating the mom and she had a teenage daughter with her pre-pandemic. It was such a great lesson for me because I was talking about healthy foods and they had opposite reactions uh, to the same healthy food and they biologically related. That's just a example for you to keep in mind that it's, it's not a one size fits all. It is highly personalized. And um, the, you know, the keto diet has some, has some good evidence in, in bipolar disorder, but not everyone has some good evidence in um, helping individuals with major mental illness. Uh, but again, there have been some case reports, there's some information, it is not a one size fits all. Um, I really agree with sort of what we've talked about today, whole foods, healthy eating, trying to not eliminate foods unless you have an actual food sensitivity or reaction and uh, discussing it with your doctor if you're going to try something new. Thank you both. Um, we have a question here from Anna um, and it's for first for Dr. Naidu. Um, do you use niacin in supplements to help reduce psychosis? So, you know, again, it, it is highly individual, individualized. Um, I do believe in a healthy whole foods diet with adequate nutrients first. I feel like, like Dr. Lee mentioned exercise, you can't exercise out of a bad diet. You can't supplement your way out of a bad diet. It's really about a very holistic plan. Are you drinking enough water? Are you exercising, doing some movement? Are you eating a whole foods healthy diet? Um, so I don't necessarily go to a supplement first. Um, and uh, you know, if, if, if I feel that someone is uh, struggling with the medication, not improving um, or needs, needs additional, um, let's say an additional boost to their symptoms, I might experiment with certain things, but they're not my first go-to if that makes sense. The only caveat I have to that, and this is important, is that there's a very large body of evidence for the use of saffron in mood disorders. But if you've ever cooked with saffron, it's very expensive and you use a very tiny amount. Mm -hmm. So the culinary amount is not equivalent to what the studies showed, which were, I think it was 15 milligrams of um, saffron was compared to uh, 20 milligrams of uh, Prozac. Um, and what I would say about that is um, it, 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 saffron is one of the supplements I would suggest because it actually has been shown in depression to be helpful. So someone is struggling with their mood and they might in fact improve a little bit with the supplement of saffron. I think it's, it's a good idea as well as supplements like vitamin D where I come from in the Northeast, many people are deficient. Um, so if you ask your, blood, your doctor to check your uh, blood test, 
you might need to supplement with that type of uh, uh, that type of thing as well, that type of vitamin as well. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Did you want to add anything to that? Yes, I do agree. Um, the other thing I want to add is that niacin is something we have studied for a long time. Um, we, you know, if you take a large dose and that is no longer the vitamin, um, so it's been more like a medication. But with more actually advanced, um, you know, technology, we know many compounds now impact on the mood and the psychosis. And for example, we have done studies looking at real food um, that can be the tree nuts and that can be avocados or um, you know, we'd also looking at, you know, purple colored uh, fruit, for example, they also have uh, compounds actually feed the gut bacteria. The gut bacteria actually make many compounds. One of them is called IPA, isopropionic acid, and that actually can really regulate the mood. So, uh, you know, that is important. I also wanted to say, and the cake it is the main, uh, you know, a flavor determinant. And without the cake, there is no frosting needed. And that what I'm trying to say is if you have a bad diet, you try to just do supplement, it may not be able to work because you have not changed the nature uh, of um, the problem. So if you don't want a you know vanilla cake and just change the frosting, change the <laughs> other things is not going to make a difference. So and we all want an easy, quick fix, but we do need to address the fundamentals. Thank you both. A uh, question from Valerie. What are the specific foods that fight depression, anxiety, OCD, and ADHD? Dr. Uma. So I have listed each chapter of my book, All Foods to Embrace and Foods to Avoid. I think it's actually particularly important to know the foods to, to stay away from or to limit or to cut back on. We touched on some of those today, but what I would just point out is that many people associate things like fast foods, junk foods, processed foods, packaged foods, artificial sweeteners, processed vegetable oils, and others as you know, being concerning if you have a family history of type two diabetes, um, or um, maybe you've gained some weight in COVID, or maybe you have heart disease in your family. But those, uh, those foods are also associated with a worsening of mental health symptoms. So that's the one thing I would say is to, to really be aware that your mental health is going to be impacted by um, eating those foods as well, because what those foods do is they impact the gut microbes that are very precious and are there in our bodies to help us uh, really function. They do so many things as we've talked about and touched on that um, it, it, it just becomes important for us to understand, uh, to understand that. Now, in terms of foods to embrace, there's, there's a list for each chapter. Um, you can start off with some basic principles, all the foods we talked about today. I believe in a plant-rich diet, uh, just because fiber is so vital to the gut microbes, that's what they thrive on. Um, you know, Understanding prebiotic foods, adding in fermented foods, these are really important um, for you to understand that uh, th they, they will help your gut. And then there are things like omega-free fatty acids, Assets, either seafood source or a vegan supplementation or um, plant-based sources such as uh, chia seeds or flax seeds um, and spices. There's a good amount of evidence, like I said, around saffron. Um, a 2017 study was the one that I referenced that demonstrated that 15 milligrams of saffron was equally effective as 20 milligrams of Prozac in decreasing symptoms of depression. Um, turmeric uh, with a pinch of black pepper has a good amount of evidence for depression, anxiety, cognition um, as well. So I think that you know, finding, um, finding a few foods that you can start to include in your diet, um, if you have a certain condition, maybe looking at that chapter and working through it in that way becomes my guideline as to how to use, uh, use the work, um, use the book, use the nutrients to, to help you feel better. Thank you. We have a question from James um, regarding cooking food. Um, does cooking 
destroy nutrients. And, and I want to add, because there was a big fad with a raw diet for quite some time. And, you know, where's the balance? Okay. Jane actually says, where's the balance? And, and I think that's a great question that, um, you know, we get a lot of information coming at us and it's not always clear what the balance really should be. You know, the truth is if human beings separate ourselves from the rest of the animals, one main reason, if not the only one, is that we learn how to use fire. I'm not meant to kill each other, but really uh, eating cooked food. Um, so the um, concern about cooking food destroy nutrients are pretty much based on research last century on water soluble vitamins predominantly. Uh, that's the B vitamins and C vitamins. When you cook, they turn to other things and you get lost um, and, you know, during the, the time of cooking. However, a lot of nutrients now we know will not be available to your body unless you cook it. You know, cooking is kind of digestion to break it down. Give an example like a lycopene, that is the red color for tomatoes. If you eat raw tomatoes, you get other vitamins, vitamin C and everything, but you will not get much of a lycopene inside of you because it's, it's combined with a huge molecule. Our body cannot break it down. Luckily, we mostly consume tomato products in the US um, in cooked form. That's tomato juice, tomato um, you know, paste, and you know, tomato sauce, and uh, they're all cooked. So what is the right balance? Um, I would think that you like a salad, you like um, you know, have a salad every day is fine, but do not limit yourself to ice iceberg lettuce. There's really no nutrition value uh, other than drag you into using processed uh, dressing uh, if you don't make your uh, olive oil vinegar yourself. And even salad should be diverse. And today I try, you know, kale. You know, I don't have to have kale. Tomorrow I have different lettuce and I add cucumbers and tomatoes. And the other part should really come to cooked even vegetables. And the cooking, other than the nutrient available to you, and the other benefit is you're able to take in a lot more than salad. If you have a playful spinach salad, if you truly cook the spinach, it's just about a cup. And the ideal amount of vegetables you intake for the day, it would be five cups. Mm -hmm. So whatever you can get there, <laughs> it would be a, you know, a great practice. I typically tell our patient five cups in quantity, combination of raw and um, you know, cooked. And the second rule is at least two colors every day to vary it up. So you get all the nutrients uh, in combination. Um, you know, we are so sophisticated. It does not have to be exactly regimented every day. Okay, I'm going to have a salad to start dinner. Well, we can store nutrients as well. So allow yourself have, you know, flexibility, um, but you do need to have books. Thank you. Um, we have quite a few questions about food and nutrition and how they can play a role in serious mental illnesses such as schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. We have a question from Krista and a question from Anna um, regarding schizophrenia. So I wonder if uh, Dr. Uma, if you could start on and, uh, and educate us on this topic. Sure. Uh, first, first and most important thing that I will say is that um, in these instances, you you know, and, and in all instances, actually, nutritional psychiatry does not exclude the use of medications and serious mental illness. Very often, someone might need to be on a medication uh, long term. And part of the way that I work with individuals around this is always encouraging a healthy diet. The second thing to say is that it's very important to understand that food never replaces medication. Why? Because serious mental illness, individuals can lose touch with reality, experience psychosis, have episodes of mania, um, become acutely suicidal. And in those instances, it's not that food can't help, but these are acute 
states in which an emergency room and emergency evaluation, seeing a doctor immediately become important. At any point in an illness, food can be helpful. In schizophrenia, omega-3 fatty acids, whether you obtain them from fatty seafood and wild sockeye salmon, or you get them from plant-based sources, are actually extremely helpful. There's some evidence for supplementation with an acetyl cysteine, and there's some good trials of that, but you can also get these nutrients from food. Um, and, you know, I list, I list those in my book. Um, things like uh, um, alpha lipoic acid from things like spinach and broccoli and others become important. Um, so what, what I've done is I've looked at the different evidence for those conditions and compiled lists of foods. Can food replace uh, medication? No. Can food enhance and help someone and complement all other forms of treatment, whether it be therapy and medication? Absolutely. Then there's some also very important principles, adequate hydration, uh, mindfulness, exercise. These are very important because some of the medications actually cause weight gain and uh, glucose intolerance. So it becomes really important for people to have an awareness as they might be enduring a severe mental illness and taking medications to also pay attention uh, to nutrition because nutrition is now a lifestyle factor. It's no longer just a diet or something we do. It's part of our lifestyle. And it has been shown to be extremely important in many conditions, um, including things like type two diabetes to actually reverse these conditions. So um, I, I wanna put it in context for you and help you understand that um, whether it's the vitamin B and C foods, whether it's melatonin, whether, whether it's the uh, strong antioxidants in, like L-theanine and green tea, all of these can be extremely helpful, but it's not one or the other, it's a combination of things. And that's what you should be you know, speaking to your doctor about. Thank you. Um, here's a question that I think many of us tackle when we were in the, Supermarket, it's a question from Valerie. Can you talk about the nutritional value of organic versus non-organic food as it affects the microbiome? Dr. Lee. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, organic is also by a standard quote, we're not using artificial, you know, pesticides or fertilizers. But that again, it is a very limited definition. I would say organic food is better, but organic food does not equal healthy. Um, there are um, you know, many ways we can judge food. For example, you can have organic whole grain bread, for example, but if you just you know, really allow yourself to indulge into it and that become not healthy. And let's say a conventionally grow and tomatoes, you concerned, let's say you concerned pesticides, you may want to peel it off. And then, you know, it is really a more nutritious, um, you know, a food choice. So I don't want the people just follow the organic, anything organic must be good for me. No, the other uh, equation is have to match your body's need. And we all sitting here talking, uh, our body only need about eight grams of sugar uh, or carbohydrate altogether every hour. So all the time we've been talking, it's just a little package of sugar we put in the coffee, two of those. And one slice of bread, it is you know, four times of that. If during this time of talking, you finish a slice of bread or you finish a peanut butter sandwich, Oh my God, you in trouble, okay? Nothing for tonight to burn it off. So that is another concept coming along. It is pick up the better food, diverse food. You have to match what your bodies need mentally and physically. I just glanced through all the questions. There are, there are almost a hundred of them. Yeah. Um, I, I, I would say, you know, a lot of them are very specific questions and do come to see a doctor or come to see us. And that's what we practice. That's what we are here for. If you have, you know, Dr. Uma's book and I have more questions and yeah, we're a local or you go to Florida to see uh, Dr. Uma. <laughs> um, 
Thank you. Yes, there are so many questions. We'll, we'll take we have just a couple more minutes. There was a question um, from Suzanne regarding grapefruit and statins. Uh -huh. That one we actually, I myself did research, all right? There is concern if you drink a grapefruit juice, you would change the metabolism of your body to uh, metabolize the statins. So we did a study, not just here, there, I'm eating a grapefruit. We use double strength grapefruit juice you're drinking every day. And even then, the impact is very, very small. If you really follow what we have just said, eating the whole fruit, you're not gonna have one grapefruit every day. You're gonna have half here and have some other time and really no significant impact on your statins. By the way, statin drugs come from a natural form and you probably heard Reddy's rice. It's a fermented rice actually containing nine different uh, statins in it. Now we have each one of them synthesized as a drug. So do not do extremes. And as long as you eat the whole food, that is different from you taking single compound out of contact. Thank you. Um, question for Dr. Yes, Dr. Okay, I wanted, I just, yeah, I just wanted to comment yes. on, on uh, add to something Dr. Lee said regarding yes. organic foods. I think that we, as a country get very stuck on definitions and including and excluding and eliminating. And I think, you know, for the most part, we need to understand what the definitions are. I also think in mental um, illness or uh, individuals struggling with their mental well-being, let's say, um, you know, people have different levels of access. There are food deserts in this country. There's food inequity. Not everyone has the same type of um, financial means. So the way that I think about it is, I totally agree, Dr. Lee, just think about it as whole healthy foods. You know, things like frozen vegetables and fruit in the United States are flash frozen. So if you don't want to you clean all of the broccoli and the cauliflower, but you can get frozen bags, they are inexpensive. And as long as they don't have sauce, sugar, added sodium, a great option for your family. Um, sometimes an organic version, and that may be cheaper than buying the actual fresh uh, food, but it's it still is nutritious. Things like the, um, if, if you're concerned about salmon being an expensive fish and you eat seafood, well, certain versions of canned salmon are inexpensive that you can still get good nutrients from. Um, canned oysters, and uh, you can get great levels of zinc from, and zinc is associated as a nutrient with really great brain health. So there are ways to negotiate the organic versus non-organic or argument that just by eating whole healthy foods and finding ways to balance your budget that way. Uh, the, even beans and legumes are a healthy source of plant-based protein that is inexpensive for a family. I just think that's caveat is important with, with mental well-being because sometimes people have difficulties financially there as well. Thank you so much. That is really important information to have. As long as you mentioned salmon, what about the debate between wild and farm raised? Okay. I, I do. <laughs> okay, I can take on that one. So wild, well, first of all, I wanted to say labeled as wild does not mm -hmm. necessarily mean the salmon has been swimming along the Pacific Ocean, along the coast, all right? And that can be also farm raised in the ocean as well. Um, so Wild means they're in a you know, free living condition. And farm raised, and the major concern, obviously they get fed um, by feeds. Feeds are pretty much corn based. So they are not as good as the fish you can imagine swimming in the ocean, take a different bite at a different time. So in that sense, wild is better than the you know, farm raised salmon. And if, you know, like Dr. Uma have said, if price is an issue, then buy frozen. And you know, can, you know, you buy, go to Costco, that's I go, buy the frozen Norwegian, you know, salmon. And, um, you know, that can really bring down the price. And, but if you also compare salmon to, let's say, you know, uh, beef, okay, and the salmon overall, because it's a fish, it still have better, 
you know, profile and then just regular beef. And also, again, it depends on what else you're eating at that time. If you, I, I just have salmon, even the farm raised with broccoli um, versus, oh God, I have wild salmon today. Therefore, I have a bowl of ice cream come along and I'm gonna have my pasta on the side. Okay, I, I, I can't say your white salmon in that context is doing you much more a benefit and then the farm salmon with broccoli alone. So those are things is my passion and Dr. Wumas as well to really communicate with the public. There is so much misinformation out there and you know, living healthy, living well does not have to be expensive. Thank you. Dr. Uma, closing comment? Well, I just want to thank you for this amazing discussion and thank Dr. Lee and Vicky and the whole team um, just for help hosting us and for really allowing this platform to share our opinions and uh, speak about nutrition in this context. I think this is one of the most important things we should be speaking about. And I, you know, I can't uh, underscore the uh, what I call the silent pandemic, which is around mental illness and what's emerged during the pandemic. And food is one way, not the only way, but one way that we can help ourselves. So I'm very grateful for this conversation and really enjoyed it, Dr. Lee and Vicki and everyone on the team. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you both. Thank you to everyone for joining us, um, being part of our open mind community. And we hope to see you on September 23rd, our next Open Mind, when we're gonna present the award-winning one woman play, Does This Show Make Me Look Fat? Written and performed by comedian Kathy Landman. And she will be joined by our faculty member, Dr. Danielle Keenan Miller, who is the director of the UCLA Psychology Clinic and a co-author of the book, The Binge Eating Prevention Workbook. Um, if you could both type into the uh, Q&A, the websites to go to, because we have a number of people asking about the juice that you mentioned, the website to see the foods, and about the Tuesday afternoon sessions on diet and nutrition, but we're out of time. So if you could type those into the Q&A, that would be wonderful. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. <laughs>